Up next, we speak with Gavin Fry. It's a good day for staying inside and just reading a book, looking at pictures. Gavin might have an idea for us, his latest publication. Well, if the adage that a picture's worth a thousand words, then those who write about art, they can have a really tough job. Well, Gavin Fry is someone who not only takes on that challenge, he does it with compelling style. Gavin is well known in this area as the former director of the Newcastle Museum, but he's also an acclaimed writer, particularly about Australian art, and he also paints as well. Gavin's written about everyone and everything from war art to the life and works of Ricka Moore and Margaret Woodward, and his latest book is about a Central Coast artist named Patrick Carroll. The book is titled The Journey, The Life and Art of Patrick Carroll and the author, Gavin Fry joins us now. Gavin, hello. How are you? Well, good morning, Scott. You staying out of the heat? Indeed, I am. Well, you know, shut down in the house. It's all good. <laughs> See, it's one of those days where it's actually good to be a writer. Normally, you rue the fact everyone else is out in the sunshine. But today, um, you can be going, thank goodness, I'm not out in the sunshine. Ah, uh, yes, I was out. I was watering the garden at 7 o'clock this morning. So I did all the jobs and then came back in. <laughs> But yes, I do spend an inordinate amount of time staring at a computer and um, and looking at other printed pages and bits of paper everywhere. So yes, it, it goes with the territory. Ah, oh, yeah, the glamorous life of a writer. <laughs> yes, indeed. Tell us about Patrick Carroll, who he was and what art meant to him. Um, yes, well, Patrick Carroll was uh, a most a fascinating character. And if I could just go back a moment, this book came to me through um, uh, one of his his daughters. He had three and I was commissioned to undertake the work. And while I knew Patrick's work, I was well aware of it. I didn't, I'd never met him, never had the pleasure of meeting him. Um, But I knew he was a very strong and powerful artist who really had made a clear statement to me, the fascinating part of the story is, and as the title suggests, the journey from a boy growing up in Bathurst you know, in the years after the war, in the early 1950s, just a kid at school, um, working class family, but at an early stage developed an interest in art. And then, of course, how he got from, you know, many of us have interests in art when we're young, but managing to make a career out of it, um, especially in a place like Sydney over the years, is a real challenge. And of course, he had absolute determination. This is what he wanted to do. And he would do it. And he did everything he possibly could to um, to reach that end. But he was also a realist. He knew that art for art's sake is, mm. is one thing, but making a living out of it, and he had a family to support, is something else. And it's a real challenge, um, especially if you're not going to become a teacher or something else on the side. He was going to be an artist and an artist he was for 45 plus years. No mean feat in Australia. Mm. And he referred to himself as an experimental realist. What does that mean? And what sort of images does an experimental realist create? Well, I suppose the thing is, if I can, without being too long-winded about it, if you think back to when he was a young man working in the 1970s, Australia was suddenly overtaken with this great rush of abstract painting, you know, and that had to be bigger and bolder. And uh, we were all under the influence of the Americans at that stage. So mm-hmm. everyone wanted to be a Jackson Pollock or a Franz Klein or somebody. But then there was a reaction to that. People who believed that art should actually be recognisable and understandable. And so right through his career, he made art that was very much about the place and time. So if he did a painting of of the countryside, you'd know exactly where it was and when it would be. Um, as he travelled over the Blue Mountains, he did wonderful, great paintings of the Blue Mountains and, of course, on into Sydney. He did Sydney suburbia. And if he did a street in Sydney, you'd know which street it was. Mm. And so that's where the realism part was. But he wasn't just, shall we say, a boring you know, uh, realist who painted exactly the way people thought that it should look. He took the known subjects and then made them something slightly different, something more exciting. Um, And that's where the experimental part came in. So he was always trying something new, trying new techniques, trying new materials, even new ways of putting things on uh, on a canvas. He would, for instance, if he wanted to move a whole lot of paint around in a hurry, instead of using a brush, 
you would grab something like, you know, glad wrap and then smear the paint and do that. Hmm. Or you would have a lump of cardboard or, a, you know, all kinds of things to try and get unusual effects that still carried the image with him. He would always say that he started off with a completely abstract picture, but in the end, you'd know exactly what it was and where it was. And of course, that's no mean feat. Um, so he was expressionist in that his paint, the paint on the canvas and on the paper, he painted very, a lot on beautiful, heavy, thick paper. Um, the way the paint is moved around tells you a lot about what he's trying to achieve. This is the thing about expressionism. It's in the making of the picture. But in the end, um, we still know his pictures for the subject. So if it's Lunar Park, you know it's Lunar Park. And if it's <laughs> if it's the entrance or somewhere up on the central coast, you recognise it. And that's about what that's what being an experimental realist is. And in twenty nineteen, Patrick Carroll died in tragic circumstances in a fire. What did the art world lose with his passing, do you reckon? Well I think like many artists of that age and stage, he's in his late sixties, absolutely built a career but was by no means slacking off. He'd, what had happened, he'd moved, he spent a lot of time in Sydney, but then moved up to the Central Coast, because as many people know, it's a pretty desirable place to be. Mm -hmm. He'd moved to the entrance, and when he was there, he was really taken by not so much painting everyday landscapes and seascapes at the entrance, but what he was taken by was the, the great change that was taking place all up and down the coast. We know it in Newcastle, Gosford places like that were absolutely booming and so he started painting great big pictures of construction sites and buildings and things like this so he was constantly on the move and to find to, to work in his own way he rented the upstairs floors in an old um, uh, shopping arcade something that had passed its use by date and he was working up there and of course, it was a space where he was a great collector of things. He had objects of every kind because they were inspirational. He made um, you know, objects as well as paintings. And unfortunately, some um, very young people decided that it would be really fun to set fire to this building one day, but they didn't realise he was inside it. And he was trapped and died before the fire brigade could get him out. Now, he was only at that stage in his late 60s. And it's a time when a great many artists and the ones certainly, even some of the ones you mentioned, an artist, for instance, like Rick Amor, who I'd written on, is now absolutely hitting his straps mm. at the age of you know, 72 or three, producing the most fantastic work and at prices that are you know, eye-wateringly high. And so the same almost with Patrick. He was at a point where he's, you know, you kind of keep working for 50 years without really working out what you're doing and where you're going. Yeah. And that's the loss, of course, that um, one thing about being an artist is you keep going until you drop. And he was absolutely in his stride. He was really making pictures that were engaging and exciting for people. And all of a sudden, bang, he stopped. Yeah. Much of it was destroyed, unfortunately, in the fire, although fortunately, and a lot of work was saved again. And so when I came to tackle the story, I was trying to, one of the things I didn't want to get caught up in was the horrible drama of his death. And you, you know, it was, it was in all the papers and the news and things at the time, but then we don't want that to disguise the story. It's a bit like the Brett Whiteley end of his life. You know, you don't want the finish to be, <laughs> to be that. And with Patrick, um, you know, he'd worked through producing great work. And I wanted to tell the story of how did he get to that point? Because one of the things that I do as an art historian and also as a painter, I suppose, I don't write deep philosophical pieces about um, art theory mm. and you know, all kinds of things. I like to tell the stories and answer the questions that people ask. Why does somebody do this? Why do they do that? I think it comes from being a school teacher for a long time ago. But, you know, I think if you can answer a form three kid and say, why does this artist do what he does? I think you're on the road. And so that's always my thing is yeah. let's tell the story. And the pictures will then almost explain themselves if you know how they come about, the context in which they're made and all of these um, stories. 
it should be, I think, a direct storytelling process, as you well know as a storyteller. Um, that to me is the story. This is our artist. This is the work. And of course, what I was mm. had great pleasure of doing is producing this in a very substantial, you know, 200 page hardcover book. And I have, again, those wonderful computers sitting on the desk. I've got two great screens staring at me. In this case, I not only write the book, but design the book and publish it on behalf of somebody. So that's, that's a real pleasure to be able to do that. With beautiful pictures uh, contained as well. How much does being an artist yourself, as I mentioned, you are an acclaimed artist, how much does that help or hinder your work as a writer when finding or searching for the words about art and artists? Funnily enough, I find it, it's not an advantage that you think it might be. I didn't paint for, I stopped painting for a long time and that's because I was doing a lot of writing in my museum work. And the reason is I found it very difficult to think about a particular artist's work and then do my own work because I'd immediately start <laughs> imitating them. Um, I've been the one who's working with someone like Albert Tucker or like with the game or, or Fred Kress and these artists who were you know, really substantial painters and, and really formed. If I'd started working then, I know I simply would have started producing something in that mould. So <laughs> to me, they're totally dis different disciplines. They're two sides of your brain. So at the moment, I hate to admit it, I've only painted one picture this year because I've, I've got two more big books on the go and but there's not room in my head for both. So <laughs> there's plenty of time. next year. I'll be on the brush again next year, but that's this year. <laughs> oh, you've got plenty of time, mate. There's still uh, three weeks oh, to go. Oh, three weeks to go. Tell me about it. There's a couple of, <laughs> there's a couple of monsters in the back cupboard, but we'll get on. And as I said, yes, it's a lovely thing to do both, but as I said, not at the same time. Well, congratulations for what you have created here, both in words and design and pictures in honouring the life and work of Patrick Carroll with The Journey, The Life and Art of Patrick Carroll, your latest book, and all the best with those two monsters you're writing at the moment. They're on the way. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Good on you. Thanks, Gavin. That is Gavin Fry, a polymath. He does so much, words and pictures, and as you heard, museum uh, director, curator as well in, in his uh, previous career, and school teacher. He's done it all, and he's still young. Mid-twenties, they're about, or well, maybe a bit older. But uh, one of those great characters and uh, in the Hunter Valley brings so much to the art and culture of our life here in the Valley.